how about this worship and the engaging creativity in music? That's what the church is all about. You know what the psalmist said? Sing unto the Lord a new song. I'm so thankful we have such an environment where we write our own music and we can take a song by you 2 my man Bono, and just crush it. Our next guest is a great friend of Bono, and we're gonna talk about that. I love this guy. He is a man's man. He's just a cool guy. He's somebody you can hang out with. I'm talking about Trey Gowdy, former, <laughs> former federal prosecutor, U.S. congressman for four terms, House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. I mean, you've, you've seen him. He was the one grilling people over the Benghazi situation from James Comey to this, to that, whoever. He has a television show on Fox. It's, it's, it's tonight. And he's a New York Times best-selling author, as we said earlier. I've known the guy since I've been, I guess, 18 years old. I'm talking about Trey Gowdy. Let's stand and give him a crazy round of applause. Trey Gowdy. This guy's the best. Trey's the best. Anytime you Google him, he's always trending. <laughs> I don't even sometimes know what that down. means. Hey, 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 sometimes down, right? <laughs> I'm, no, I'm joking. I'm anyway. so old, I don't even know what trending oh, means. Oh, Trey, you're not. You look great. I mean... You know, gray hair is a sign of wisdom, the Bible says. <laughs> Did you know that? Uh, either that or I forgot my hair dye, one or the <laughs> other. <laughs> well, I used, to, I used to be on the bottle. I used to try to dye my hair. It didn't really work, so I'm like, man, I'm going natural. I was trying to figure out why your father's hair is still naturally no. brown, and you and Ben have a little yeah. fleck of gray in it. Dad will dye his hair. He never tells us. Of course, it's obvious. It looks like shoe <laughs> polish, but that's okay. <laughs> He said that, I did not. Right, right. <laughs> Trey Gowdy, this guy is phenomenal. What a light, what a voice for, we're gonna find out first of all, the Lord Jesus, and secondly, for truth. Trey, tell us real quick, because you're from the dirty south like I am, about your life, about your beginnings and, you know. Uh, Born in Greenville, South Carolina, grew up in Spartanburg. Uh, father is a baby doctor. Mom uh, stayed at home, um, raising me, and I have three sisters, so whoever tells you God won't give you more than you can handle did not grow up with three sisters. <laughs> uh, and then I met uh, at church on a Sunday night. See, listen, at, say that again, at church, at church, on a Sunday night, at church. Sitting over there with my parents, and I saw this young girl on the other side of the sanctuary. I wasn't paying a bit of attention to the sermon. See, don't you love that? Sanctuary. I lo Trey, Trey, Most sanctuary. I love it. Beautiful yes. thing I had ever seen in my life. And uh, come August, we will have been married 32 years. Um, Two children, uh, both of whom went to law school because, as you know, there's a shortage of lawyers in the world. So, yeah, we need more lawyers, Trey. Yeah. Well, I'm doing my part. Um, <laughs> and just uh, I love being home. Uh, there's something about being home. And my wife grew up in Spartanburg, and I was a district attorney there. And um, you know, I'm at you and I are about the same place in life where, if we're lucky, we have about a third left and two thirds yeah. in the rearview mirror and I just want to uh, spend it with her uh, and home. I mean, home is one of the most beautiful words in, in the English language. Isn't that true? It's just a beautiful word. Yes. So. There's no place. There's no place like it. Trey, I love what you said because in, in our culture today that in many circumstances and situations is, is wheels off, looking for that true north, looking for the anchor, I love how church attendance wasn't even optional for you, was it, growing up? <laughs> uh, if the church was open, we were there, and uh, the, I never reconciled how 
Dallas can be God's team, but yet my father will not let me watch them on Sunday afternoons because <laughs> he made me go to training union and RAs. And then, you oh, know, yeah, I remember. Uh, one yep. sermon's not enough, so I had to go sermons. Sunday night. And then Wednesday was choir practice. Yes. Just, I mean, you know, we went to the Carolina football games on Saturday night, so we got back after midnight from Columbia, but mm -hmm. not going to church. You know, my dad's rule was if you are too sick to go to church, you are too sick to do anything else. So I there's love no it. going outside. Yes. There's... So that's a great rule. And you know, uh, I'm always the same way, Trey. Every uh, moment that I was at church as a kid is, was not the most engaging uh, time or, or, or a little span. Uh, obviously, most of it was awesome. Looking back, I am so thankful, and I know you are too. And, and wouldn't you tell parents to do that as well? I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I mean, you can't. My structure is good. Yes, and it consistency is. is good. And um, you know, your peer group, particularly at that point in life, oh. uh, is an outsized you know, source of influence in your life. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I look back on it. I know my mom watched probably the only person in the world that would watch both of our interviews would be my mom. <laughs> so she may be watching right now too, yeah. but you know, look, I mean, I was tired coming in. I mean, if I, if it had been left up to me, but there's a reason we don't let 13 year olds vote or drive or sign contracts. That, yeah. Is that and, a fact? You know, my, my mom, uh, we're, we're, we're going to church. Yeah. So. And you know what? There's so, again, you're in God's house and I, I tell people too, I mean, just, just go to church. And it's not always going to be, uh, for example, we even do things here at Fellowship Church that wouldn't necessarily be my style. However, I know that it reaches other people. And some things we do be my style. So sometimes people go, well, I don't know about the music or I don't know about what you're talking about. <laughs> well, okay, fine. I'm, I'm the same way. So, so you commit to it and you stay with it. How did you, Trey, become a follower of Christ? Tell me, tell me about that, because you're obviously a Christian. How, how did that happen? Well, not unlike yourself, obviously growing up in church, you hear the message. Um, I was sitting with my older sister. My parents were at a medical convention, <laughs> and I told my sister, I'm going to go join the church. I'm going to walk to the front of the church and make a public profession of Christ. And she said, well, you can't do that because mom and dad aren't here. And I think I said something like, watch. So... <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I mean, and, yeah. and, and I am, you know, my wife and Mary Langston, who is, has been with me uh, forever now, there are people who can make that early profession of faith and it stays with them forever. Mm -hmm. And then there are those who maybe don't appreciate or understand the gravity of that decision. Yeah. And then you go through what I went through, which is what the poets call a dark night of the soul, where you began later, and this was in my early 20s, having the conversation that maybe you should have had sooner. Mm -hmm. So I remember needing a source of truth, needing uh, not just the reward at the end of a life well lived, but yeah. something to get you to the end. And yeah. I, need, I need a code of conduct. And the teachings of Christ are worth following even if there were not a reward at the end. That's true. Even if, yeah, even if there was no such thing in heaven, it's, the, it's just the best way to live. But obviously there's heaven. And, and so you, you made that personal decision, Trey. Really, I mean, you, you understood it in your early 20s and that was, boom, that was it. Well, I'm also lucky in that I, uh, you know, little bit of a, of a skeptical mind, maybe even trending. No, toward, that's a shocker. Yeah, I, uh, spoiler alert, may, maybe <laughs> a, a little bit of a, of a skeptic and I need to see the sermon rather than hear one. Yes. So God gave me, uh, as a wife, the most authentically lived, um, spiritual life that I have ever that's witnessed. Phenomenal. So Look, I love listening to great pastors and I love great teaching, but there's nothing as persuasive oh. as an authentically lived life. So I get a sermon every time I watch or interact with other people. I, I don't follow the sermon always, <laughs> but um, she's just an uh, a, a almost superhumanly good oh. person. 
God's good. And you know, I would rather see a sermon, I'm like you, than hear one. There's, there's nothing like the power of, of, of seeing that. But, but I'm, 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 so, I'm so thrilled, Trey, to hear about just your background and that consistency and the, the commitment. All right, fast forward, you go to Baylor and the first guy that you meet is the uh, second most handsome of the young boys uh, behind, behind you, probably tied with Cliff. Uh, Thank you. I did not know a soul. I'm gonna send that statement to Ben. <laughs> well, he knows it's true. He knows it's true. Uh-huh. I, I didn't know a soul. So my father said, you can go to the Citadel, which is a military school in South Carolina, Ooh. or you can go to work. And I did not appreciate the virtues of getting up early uh, an all-male education <laughs> or having short hair. Uh, I still don't appreciate any of those three virtues, but I certainly <laughs> didn't appreciate them when I was 17. Yeah. And my pastor went to Baylor, Alistair Walker. I didn't know that. And he, he convinced my father to let me go to Baylor. Did not know a soul. The first person to befriend me at Baylor was Benjamin Blake Young. My middle brother, the... Well, now we have to call him Dr. Ben Young. Trey, not Ben, it's Dr. Ben Young. He's that is that earned, earned or honorary? No, it's that, earned. It's His earned. Is earned. Okay. Right. Yes. Well, that does prompt me. I do. I, I owe you an apology. Uh, okay. The first time we met, yeah. uh, you were with Lisa, and yes. y'all were dating. We were dating. That's how long we've known each other. All Lisa right. and, I were and Ben and I are shooting basketball in the driveway, and y'all walk inside, and I said, she is way too good looking for your brother. <laughs> I do not give this relationship six weeks. <laughs> and, and I bet him, I said, I'll give you $5 if they're together, you know, two months from now. Yeah. And y'all celebrated what anniversary yesterday? 39th, yesterday. So, so I'm going to Venmo you $5. I owe you $5, okay, and I'll Venmo you. you that. You'll Venmo it to me. Okay. I'll get, I'll get, some, I'll get one of my kids to show me how to Venmo. There you go. That's and then I'll thought. Venmo you the money. That's what I thought. Well, Ben, you know, is, is again, as I said earlier, my, my middle brother, he's a uh, prolific author, and he and Trey, I mean, you, you and Ben, are, he's one of your closest friends. I mean, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but I mean. We were talking this morning about watching this black and white television in his dorm room, uh, watching you know, politics, and I never won an argument with your brother, which prepared me very well for marriage, but you would think... <laughs> You would think that, you know, this guy's going to be a trial lawyer. He's going to be in politics. Surely he can win one argument with a preacher. Never won one with your brother. He's he's brilliant, yeah. Your brother was that source of consistency. You know, you're away from home. Mm -hmm. You're pulled in all these directions. I'm going to tell you something that you may not know. Every now and again, sometimes kids that grow up in structured environments may rebel from No way. Yeah, I'm not... I'm not kidding. Sometimes. I've never heard of that. Your brother was so consistent. I don't mean pharisaical. I mean, he yes. was so consistent. And, um, and yeah, of course, I'm going to stay in contact with him. He is a prolific author. He wrote a book on doubt. And it takes a ton of faith to write a book on doubt. Yes, it does. Well said. Well said, sir. So, Trey, Baylor, law school, University of South Carolina, you're a rock star, all of a sudden you get into politics. Well, I ran for district attorney, which is elected, but it's not really partisan. There are no R&D issues. And I I needed, it was Mother's Day 2009, my wife and my mom, who are the two biggest influences in my life, Mm -hmm. said, you need to go do something else. When all you see is depravity and evil, you think it is all that exists. And you know, when you're a prosecutor, particularly a homicide prosecutor, it's all you see. And so they sat me down and said, you need to go do something else. Um, And uh, I don't think they meant Congress, but uh, (laughs) I mean, if you're kind of a washed up over the hill trial lawyer, your your options Uh are limited. So I ran, uh, but you know, if you're coming through the receiving line at the end for me and you're speaking to my wife, I hope you will say he was a good prosecutor. That means a lot more to me than the eight years I spent in Congress. That is the job I would like people to judge me by. Interesting. Um, 
being in a courtroom, standing up for people that can't stand up for themselves. Mm. Powerful. It's Ray. Trey's, uh, I mean, as far as, you know, his commentary and being on different shows and things, intergalactic, a lot of people were talking about, okay, Trey's going to be the next president, which he, I mean, I think if he wanted to, he probably could do that. But Trey decided really at the zenith to go, you know what, we out. So you, you left after four terms. Undefeated and unindicted, which is rare. Uh, <laughs> that's good. I would have left sooner. Uh, my, my weakness in life is friendship and loyalty. And I had made the decision to leave sooner. And then Tim Scott, you know, Washington can be a lonely place. Uh, we were lucky. We had a lot of really good friends, including one from this area named John Ratcliffe. Mm -hmm. But Tim and I were sitting at that dinner table that we so frequently sat at, and he said, will you just do it one more time? It meant something to him and to me for him to be elected from South Carolina mm -hmm. when the Civil War began, oh, an yeah. African-American senator elected to his first full term. He wanted us to campaign together and be on the ballot together. We even debated our opponents together. I, I don't know it. that any <laughs> congressman and senator have had a joint debate for office, yes. but um, he talked me into staying that fourth term, but even after that, even friendship wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't love it, and I didn't perceive that I was good at it. And if you don't like it and you're not good at it, you probably should not do it. That's, I don't want to give you all career advice, but if you're not good at it and you don't like it, you probably should not <laughs> yeah, do, do it. it. <laughs> well, I think you were great at it. But anyway, Tim Scott, African-American, uh, close friend of Trey's, uh, congressman as well, they wrote this book called unified and please pick that up it's on i know it was a new york times bestseller it's on amazon and we're it's a, it, it it is it was look i i worried about the health of every english teacher i had when they heard that i wrote a book i mean they'd be surprised if i read a book when you <laughs> say he wrote a book wrote it, yeah um, I wanted Tim to write a book about the story of his life, and mm -hmm. he is so humble. He said, let's write one together. Oh, wow. About uh, the beauty of unlikely friendships. I mean, isn't you know, that great? The media says, well, you're, you're almost exactly the same age. You're both Republicans. You're both from the state of South Carolina. And I thought, how great is it that a black man and a white man from South Carolina can write a book together, and it's no big deal? Only and, God. Only God. Uh, uh, well, Tim and I grew up very, very differently. And we, he's an optimist, and I'm a cynic. And he, 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 so we have That's a great. ton of differences, but just the power and the beauty of pursuing relationships yes. that would be considered unusual. Mm -hmm. So it's, and, it's a book about unity, which, of course, our country doesn't need any of that right now. No, but upon, no. Upon the remote chance that we ever need it in the future. That's, Trey, I want to hear, you, last night over dinner we were talking about this whole racial issue that is uh, plaguing our culture today. And you, you said something, just the way you said it, you were paraphrasing some texts in the Bible, some words of Jesus. And I, I want you to kind of address that again. I don't know the Bible verses that you know. Let's go. So uh, I don't know I, about I, that. But I, sometimes I, I get them confused it. with the lyrics from U2 songs. But I think... <laughs> I think there is a verse that says, in Christ there is no Jew, no Gentile, no, no, no male, nor female. And I bet if you ask him, he would say there is no black, brown, That's and right. White. So if he doesn't see color, we should not see color. That's right. And, and our country, uh, particularly my state, has a rich and provocative history as it relates to that. And, um, you know, the other thing that's a challenge for me and where Tim is so helpful is where there is pain, but there has been progress and there is the hope and promise of a better tomorrow. How yes. do you balance that? I mean, you cannot ignore the pain, but you can't focus on it because then you ignore the progress. And we have to have the proportion in life of acknowledging that we could have been better, that we still can be better. Yes. But, but not constantly being negative about the greatest experiment in self-governance the world has ever known. 
which is America. Yeah. So pain and progress, how do you balance them? And that's kind of where I am in life, finding the right proportions. Mm -hmm. Well, Trey, you do a great job. What's it like, Trey? I've always wanted to ask someone uh, like you this question. What's it like having a television show? Because I'm sure here we watch you tonight. You'll be on at, what, 7 o'clock Central or? 7 o'clock Eastern, Eastern, 6 p.m. Central. Okay, so, okay. so we're watching you, and it's like, oh, man, that's easy. He just gets on there and blah, 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 blah. Well, it's I not that blah, 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 easy, is it? It takes me, partly because I'm a slow learner, it takes me about three days to get ready for that one hour because I, I like to, I think you're more persuasive if you own the words that you mm -hmm. are expressing. I don't know if anyone's seen the movie Anchorman and wonder how did Ron Burgundy read that off the teleprompter. <laughs> I no longer wonder that because you it's become easy to do, isn't it? so wed to it. You think, well, that's the exact same sentence I just read. Maybe none of the people watching will notice. <laughs> it uh, yeah. Trial work was not hard for me because you have the interaction yes. with the jury. Public speaking is not hard. But there's no one in the room when you're filming. Ooh. You're just looking at this innate object and how to, how to connect with people when you're not with people. Uh, look, I'm not a pro. You're a pro communicator. Yeah, right. I'm not a pro. Yeah, well. And they better watch tonight because who knows, Fox may pull the plug on me by this time. <laughs> I mean, I may not make it to July 4th, yep. but they're, they're great. I, not only do they let me do the show, Ed, they let me, I, I've had Democrats on because I want to prove that you can have you can have contrast with people without the conflict, without yes. the yelling and the screaming right. and the ad hominem attack. So. Yeah. Trey, you know, Trey is a living, breathing, walking, talking example of reaching across the aisle. And as Trey and I have been talking, one of the great values, well, obviously, of, of Jesus and the church is literally reaching across the aisles, befriending people who are not followers of Christ, who don't even believe, who are dogged with doubts, who are cynics, who are maybe in some deep sin, and they're like, wow, I'm not sure about this whole God thing. And I just want to compliment, Trey, you and also Fellowship Church, because one of our values, of course, it's, it's not ours, it's Jesus, is reaching across those aisles, because we have so many people each and every Sunday, many who have not stepped over the line yet. And it's because of, of people, fellowship churchers, who reach across the aisle, who connect. And if you pray those high-risk prayers for people, God is going to give you the ability, a greater ability, I believe, to reach across the aisles. And one day, you'll get to share your story like you're sharing your story with me. So uh, that, that, that's, that, that's one, you're known for that, and that's a Christ-like quality. Well, thank you for saying that. I do covet, I mean, the word I covet the most is fair. I want people to say I know you that. made an effort to be fair. Yes. When I think of Jesus, I think of someone who not only broke down barriers, the woman at the well, uh, the parables he told yep. that are, that are cross-religion, cross-nationality, mm -hmm. but he also is the ultimate bridge builder. There's no way to get from an imperfect man to a perfect God, but through a bridge. So the ability to break down barriers and also build wow. bridges is what makes you the son That's of God. Right. And, and isn't that cool? The cross, the death, burial, and resurrection is that bridge. It's the bridge. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, changing the subject again, which uh, I love to do. I have a feeling I'm going to need a lawyer. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. Well, Trey is uh, one of Trey's, one of his brilliant facets is that of asking questions, Trey. And so many of us, that's why you've written a book on it, have lost the art of the question. I love asking questions, and you're great at asking questions as well. I'm not saying I'm great at it, but I just like to do it. No, you are I great feel like at it. when I ask him one a question, I take a trip in my mind because I'm putting myself in their shoes. I'm looking at their life through their eyes. That's, how, that's what I think about. Questions seem to get pigeonholed as a request for information. Who, what, when, where, how. 
And if I were to ask you what time it is, that is a request for information. But when you can accept questions as a means of persuasion, how to persuade someone not mm -hmm. by issuing a series of declarative statements. I mean, pick whatever contentious issue you want. You have an option. You can say, I believe the following. Or you can simply say, tell me what you believe and why. And then if you listen to that answer, they're going to give you an opening where you can say, okay, I, you mentioned they. Who, what do you mean by they? Or you, you used a word. Tell me what you mean by that word. So I embrace questions as a way to persuade people. Yes. And, and it's, it's incremental. It, the, mm -hmm. I, I'm not aware. Maybe there are these, I'm going to go from this religion to that religion, this political orthodoxy to that in 15 minutes. Maybe there are those examples, but progress is usually incremental. Yes, it is. And so I, I the, the ability to ask, number one, who's your jury? Yeah. I mean, who are you talking to? Because last night you and I were talking, but I was really directing it to your daughter who was not part of the conversation. That's right. But, but the question was designed for her. Brilliant. What is your purpose in asking the question? Yes. Is it if you don't know your objective, chances are great you're not going to hit it. I am stunned. I've got colleagues who will call me before committee hearings, and they'll say, look, I get five minutes, we'll fill in the blank. What should I ask? And my question is always, what's your purpose? What, what do you want to use yes. the five minutes for? If I don't know your purpose, I can't tell you what questions to ask. That's right. See, your purpose Trace, is to persuade. Correct. You have to have a different type of question. I love that because, again, going back to, to the church, our church here at Fellowship Church, we, we try to ask compelling questions. And when I'm speaking, for example, I'm having conversations, as we talked about, with someone who's a follower of Christ, but I'm also thinking about, okay, how about that person who's a cynic? How about that person who's struggling with heroin? How about that person working in the sex industry? How about that person whose marriage is hanging from a balance? So you're having one conversation and asking questions and hopefully answering those and it's purpose driven, but then also too, you're thinking about, okay, the other person at the table. And when churches get that and when people get that, like you do, obviously you have it you know, on the next level, some great things happen, don't they? It is, uh, I think questions are the most powerful and long-term way of actually persuading people. I do too. Uh, it, because it makes the object of your question do the thinking and carry yes. the burden. And when you convince yourself of something, that is far longer lasting than, if, look, my mom got me to come in at 11 o'clock, 11 p.m. She got me to do it by sheer force and threat of my life. But, but there are other ways to get people to see yes. the virtue in something other than just a directive. Yep. So I, look, I could have written a question about a, a book about golf or Bono or Ric Flair. Yeah, but let me I stop. Wrote, let me stop. <laughs> Trey, tell us about, this guy is a ridiculous golfer. I'm talking about scratch handicap, drop the mic. Scratch means like par. And I know and you play a little golf. I know you're so busy. I only get to play four or five times a week. So That's I, all. Well, I, <laughs> look, you were a phenomenal athlete. To get a scholarship to play basketball at, at a major university is a, look, there has to be something for people who are not athletic. Well, I did this most of the time, but thank you, Trey. I really <laughs> yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, but that. you had to be pretty I never good. mentioned the fact that I played college basketball. <laughs> they don't even know that. They've never oh. heard that. Oh, they're, they're like, Ed, you played at Florida State? It's a shocker. You, your brother, Ben, was a very, very good basketball player. He was player. good, yeah. You were good, so because God is ben, merciful. Ben, ben could not beat me. I just want to say that. <laughs> You know that's true. Why? What, there, there's a verse about pr pride. I know, pr I know, uh, yeah. I know. Uh, I think you that watch. was another The next time we play, he's going to kill me. <laughs> See, that's, that's what happens. I pick golf because it's either golf or chess when you have no athleticism. <laughs> and I couldn't figure out where to put the pieces on the chess board. Yeah. So I said, let's play golf. And, you know, next Sunday, 
I will be playing in a tournament with my father, who is 82, and is my son, great? who is 29. Find me another sport where you can play you, competitively you can't, you can't. with that age disparity. How many people in here enjoy playing golf? I've never asked that question. Wow. Keep your hands up. No one looking. <laughs> no one stirring. That's good. That's a lot. And then a follow-up question would be, how many of you play it but don't enjoy it? Because it is, <laughs> it is hard. It's a hard sport. Your Trey, father's good at it. Your dad's a good guy. Yeah, he, oh, yeah, dad, dad loves the game. He's, uh, he'll be 85, Trey. Dad, dad's a force of nature. You know, I talk about him a lot. Trey said something about dad that uh, I've, I've never heard said before. Trey's friends with Bono. I, I, I was shocked. He, he started comparing Bono to my father. Now, here's a guy that knows all these people from, you know, these power brokers from Obama to Trump, from Trump to Bill Gates to whoever. And, and what did you say about Bono and dad? Well, I preface it, Buss, in case my wife is watching, that my wife is the most charismatic person I've ever met. You know in my that. Life. So I, I do want to say that she actually is. But you, I would put your father and Bono um, are the two most charismatic. And when I mean charismatic, I mean the ability in a non-prideful way to just take over whatever room they Woo, yes. are in. So, I mean, I look, I, I've been around Bono, I guess, five or six times. He has a passion for Africa and for underserved people groups. And so he walks into a room and he's got on black leather pants and rose colored sunglasses. And you're sitting there thinking whatever you're thinking. And what comes out of his mouth is more depth on the issue than any of the senators or members of the wow. house. But he does it in, in a humble way. Um, and he is a believer. So I wanted to ask yes. him about your favorite song, The End of the World. He wrote a song about Judas. Have you guys Scarry. ever heard The End of the World? Hey, can we, hey can, we, can we find that and play that? We'll play it in just a second. It, it's like, ha, ha. He, I was drowning. I'm trying to get over how old you and I feel that no one out here has heard the end of the no, world. No, the song is written from Judas's perspective, man. Yeah. It's powerful. He, well, uh, I just. <laughs> but I mean, Bono is a poet trapped in a rock band. And, yeah, he is. Uh, he's, um, you know, all the media's outside. The speaker, it was either Boehner or Paul, knew that I really liked him. I mean, Bono's not going to go see a lowly member of the house, but he will stop by and see the speaker of the house. I probably spent 45 minutes talking with him, and at the end, the media, of course, wants to know, what y'all talk about, what y'all talk about? The honest answer was we talked about Jesus for about 45 <laughs> minutes. Trey, I've got to ask you, I've got to ask you about the media because, man, Woo! I mean, but you, but you know the teeth of the media like no one. What's the deal? Well, I, I, I don't, I don't want to criticize them, but I hope. No, you'll I know. I hope you'll have me back to do that oh, some other you know time. It. You know, uh, it. we need a societal referee. We need an umpire. Mm -hmm. uh, we need that neutral, detached arbiter. Uh, every functioning society needs that, and it's supposed to be the media. It was not the Democrats that were a headwind for me the eight years I was there. They believe what they believe, and I assume they represent yep. their constituencies. I did expect uh, the media to make a little more of an effort um, at not putting their finger on the scale. And th so the biggest headwind I faced was what I believed to be uh, a non-objective media. And, and not the Democrats. You're saying it's the media. I mean, I mean you know, typical Democrats against Republicans, Medi Republicans is it. So Just, it's the media. You say that is the biggest. Joey headwind. Kennedy is a very progressive, was a very progressive yes. member of the House from Massachusetts. Yeah. So you know, you, when you sit down at the table with Joey, you know what yeah. you're going to get. He's also a very fair person yes. and one of my favorite people that mm -hmm. I served with. But you expect the media to be that umpire that calls balls mm -hmm. and strikes. And even if you don't like them, you respect them. And I don't see that in our no, I don't either. culture anymore. No, no. And what happens 
Ed, is when you have been the victim of what you perceive to be unfairness, yes. it recalibrates the Ooh. way you view fairness. Yes. So if you were wrong to me, I no longer desire fairness. I deserve a makeup call. Mm -hmm. I mean, being treat. Look, I've not been the victim of unfairness, but imagine being incarcerated for something you did not do. Imagine being accused of doing something you did not do. It is the worst feeling in the world when you are the victim of unfairness. And I think that's impacting our culture because we no longer value fairness because we are waiting on the makeup calls on both sides. Mm -hmm. And I think it's Well said, sir. Well. Speaking of makeup calls, let's talk about professional wrestling. Trey and I both love professional wrestling and we like more of the old school wrestling. And Trey has mentioned, um, and then we can quote him, you know, we talk about great athletes, we talk about Michael Jordan, we talk about Tiger Woods, we talk about Tom Brady, but Trey goes, no way. Let me hear, in your opinion, He's the greatest athlete of your time. Ric Flair is the greatest athlete. Yes! And a lot of people don't even know who Ric Flair is. Isn't that sad? That's sad. These uh, young people, they, they are missing it. They need to YouTube Ric Flair. And I hate to go old school, but I'm just, he, he, there's no one uh, like him. I, uh, if you were to put personalities on the opposite ends of the spectrum, you would have my wife on this end and Ric Flair on that end. <laughs> But I make my wife, to the extent I have any control over her, come and watch these YouTubes because the, and I tell kids who say, how do I handle the media? How do I become a better public speaker? Go watch Ric Flair interviews or go watch Nick Saban I'm gonna send this segment to Ric Flair. Well, I'm gonna send look, it to him, he will love it. Flair, it, 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 just simple things like calling the name of Tony Schiavone. How do I know Tony Schiavone? Because that's who would interview Ric Flair. Yeah. And he would just at the right time say, he's talking to his big group, he's ignoring the question, but he brings the guy in by calling his name. Brilliant. So you think he's answering the question, but he's not. Yes. Saban is a math. I've never met Nick Saban, but Coach you Saban. watch his yes. press conferences. Oh, brilliant. Oh. Nick Saban, yes. So. Flair, greatest, gen greatest athlete of my generation. What a and quote. <laughs> That's tweetable. Post that on Instagram, <laughs> Facebook. Uh, wow. And I'll say goodbye to my wife who would have turned off at this point when, when she <laughs> hears me say Ric Flair is the greatest athlete of my generation. Yes. I, some people think professional wrestling is, is not real. I don't oh, know why I can't they believe think that. that, but that, that that's a joke. I mean, yes, it's real. Yes. Trey, last question. We're having such a good time. And Trey taught me something too. Check this out. This is, how long can a person concentrate when they're hearing a speech or, or like a conversation? What's the maximum amount of time? Of course, I missed it, Trey. 17 minutes and there should be a class in every seminary in yep. the United States of America 17. on that topic. You stand in front of a jury and you can literally, even in provocative yeah. homicide cases, you just have a window of time within which to persuade and it's 17 minutes. Isn't that crazy? That's my goal, 17 minute sermons. Okay, so. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> this guy's too quick, man. He's just like, how about cancel culture? I mean, for example, Trey, let me, let me tell you this. We promote, I say we, our, our media team, our technology team promotes Trey Gowdy being at Fellowship Church. We posted it on Facebook. <laughs> Cancel us. What a joke. Did you know that? I'm not surprised. I know, I know. I just wanted to tell you I'm, that. I'm not surprised. And I, you know, you go through life and you think of all the things you have learned from people that you did not think you could learn anything from. I have never been afraid of interacting with people that disagree with me. I haven't I either. The, the better facts, the yes. better argument will prevail. 
I will say this about me. I do not have a First Amendment right to speak at your church. I am here because you afforded me mm -hmm. that right. So we do need to keep the First Amendment separate. Yes, sir. From our ability to vote with our pocketbooks. Mm -hmm. You know, my father would not let us watch Gilligan's Island. He would not let us watch Sesame Street. He would not let us watch Happy Days. That was my father's way of voting with his television what his kids now i watched every one of them as soon as i got out of his house and you can throw in dallas and dynasty along with it <laughs> so i made up for it yeah. but it can't be cancel culture to say i'm not going to spend my money in certain ways mm -hmm. but the notion that first of all whoever may have punished you for having me has probably seen me for 15 seconds on, That's a, right. on a YouTube clip, and you cannot devolve a 56-year-old life into what you see on That's television. That's it. That's so true, guys. And it's very easy, Trey. It's very easy as human beings to look at someone, even just in life, and take a snapshot of them at a certain point and judge them based on that window when they don't see you me or your friends or whoever, they don't see the backstory. They don't know what you've gone through. They don't know, you know, the dark nights of the soul. They don't know the questions and doubts, but they're just like, oh, there's Trey and he's blah, 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 you know, or there's whoever. I think that's good, especially for students to know that because in this world of, you know, social media, man, it's easy to just see a couple of images. I'm gonna pass judgment, boom. Man, you don't know that person. If all you ever do is talk to people that already agree with you, then how will you ever persuade? They don't need to be persuaded. That's so right. So I, I, number one, I learned, mm -hmm. I, I, I never passed up a chance to talk to a defense attorney. I knew what I was going to do in the courtroom, and I knew what he or she was going to do, but I learned something when I listened to them. I, look, I had... Uh, Democrats on, uh, I've had them on three of my first four nights on Sunday night. And, and look, there are people, you know, well-meaning people that ask me as partner, why would you have Democrats on your show? Why would I not? I mean, if you are, right. if you are, if you are confident in your perspective, yes, then how sir. is it a challenge to you to hear from someone else? You, you may, it may make you and, better at arguing what yeah, you believe. And that's what, and, and obviously that's what Jesus commands us to do. You know, Trey, the other day, let me be careful how I say this because I don't, hopefully they're not watching, but Lisa and I had dinner at this little restaurant with a couple in their late 60s. They are polar opposite from us. I'm talking from matters of faith, matters of just how we live, how we roll. And we knew going into it, it was a casual thing, that that, that could be the case. And those times, I want you to speak to this, cause great growth. I believe spiritually it matures us. And it was so fun to see Lisa and just the whole interaction. Of course, and when you're talking, you're praying, Holy Spirit, lead me what to say. But, but it, was a, it was a fun, engaging uh, conversation because they didn't say it, but they knew we were pastors. You, I mean, obviously you could tell they knew, you know, and, and, and uh, so, so I don't know. I just, I think we need more of that. I love that. I think one of the easiest things in the world to do is ratify or validate what people already believe. And, um, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if you want a real challenge, persuade people yes. who do not currently agree with you. Right. I mean, just repeating back. I mean, I need a good pollster, and then I just need to tell you what you already believe. Yes. Getting someone to look at an issue in a different light, even if they don't fully convert to your position, at least there's, at least they have a better understanding. I had a colleague... Peter Welch from Vermont, and it was a very contentious issue, maybe the most contentious issue in all of politics we were debating on a committee. And so all the sides are aligned as you would expect them to be, except Peter Welch from Vermont, very progressive guy, said, I want to understand what you believe and why you believe it. Wow. I want to understand wow. it. 
So not in a sarcastic, yes. dismissive way. I think there are many people out there like that. Look, I have uh, a daughter, because God has a sense of humor, that, uh, that she wants to be a criminal defense attorney. She, she's never met an innocence project that she would not. I think her goal is to undo every conviction that her father got. <laughs> She may be successful because she's really good. I, I love hearing her perspective mm-hmm. on the justice system. Yeah. Because it, it does. It forces me to say, okay, well, maybe we could be better here. Yeah. Or maybe, and I think she would tell you, you know what? Nah, she wouldn't tell you she'd learn anything from her father, but she has learned something <laughs> from her father. She'd never admit it, but yeah. I think she, she has. Yeah. Trey, thank you for being here with us. This has thank been you great. All. Thank you all. I know this has lasted more than 17 minutes, but <laughs> I've been engaged the whole time. I don't know about you. Hey, I do want to give uh, you an opportunity, though, to make the decision that Trey made when, when he was younger to, to establish a personal relationship with Christ. You know, it's, it's um, really like ABC. It, it's, it's simple to explain but it's the most profound and the deepest decision anyone can ever make. And the A part is all you have to do is admit the obvious to God that you're not perfect, that you're a sinner. And when you admit that, God's not going, oh, I didn't know that. Of course, God knows that we're sinners. And B, we believe to the best of our ability that God sent Jesus Christ to live perfectly, to die sacrificially, to to conquer death, to rise again. We believe that. Even though we have some doubts, people are like, man, I've got doubts. Good, that means you have faith. And then C, commit your life, as Trey talked about commitment, commit your life to Christ. Just say, Jesus, the best of my ability, I receive what you did for me by dying on the cross for my sins, by rising again, and I give my life to you. Tax, title, and license, as I like to say. So I'm gonna give you a chance to do that And also, um, I want to pray a prayer of of, uh, boldness, how we can reach across the aisles. And one day, God will give us an opportunity, I believe, to share our story and maybe to invite them to a safe place to hear a dangerous message. Okay, let's pray. Father, I'm going to pray a prayer. And this is a prayer that Trey and I prayed years ago, but this can be a prayer, and I believe it's going to be a prayer for many here. You might be at one of our prison campuses You might be in Florida. You might be in Fort Worth, Dallas, Frisco. Just say this. Just say, God, I admit to you, A, that I have fallen short of your standards. My moral scorecard doesn't look good. I'm a sinner. But I, B, believe that you, Jesus, died on the cross for my sins. You paid the price for all of my iniquities for all of my moral foul-ups. And right now, I commit my life to you. I believe and I receive, Jesus, your forgiveness, your grace, which is unmerited favor, and your mercy. And right now, Jesus Christ, come into my life. It doesn't matter where you are, doesn't matter what you did last night, last week. The Bible is all about that second chance, and that's grace. That's grace. If you prayed that prayer, that's the best thing you'll ever do. That's it. Others of us, hey, we prayed that prayer, but maybe this has been a wake-up call. Trey's brilliant words of reaching out and committing to the church and, and, and sharing with people as God gives us opportunity to, to know them and to love them and to build those bridges toward them and with them. So Father, we thank you for this time and we ask all these things in Christ's name, amen.